So welcome everybody. My name is Stephen Feuerstein. I'm a developer advocate at Oracle Corporation and lead a team of developer advocates. And one of my prize members of my team is Chris Saxon, who will now introduce Hi. himself. Hi everyone, it's nice to meet you. I'm, as Stephen says, Chris Saxon. There's one of the SQL advocates. I'm here to help you get the best out of Oracle Database and SQL. And even though his official title is developer advocate for SQL, and my official title is developer advocate for PL SQL, actually what we're interested in helping is helping you develop better, more secure, faster applications in Oracle Database overall. And while I tend to be pretty limited just to PL SQL because I've just focused on that so exclusively for so long, Chris is much more of a deep generalist, just like Connor McDonald, his co Ask Tom answer team and member of my team. So that's why I make sure that Chris is on my session so that when <laughs> questions come out outside of my bailiwick, we know we get an answer. So this month on Ask Tom Office Hours session for PL SQL, we're going to take a look at cursor variables, and we'll dive into that in just a moment. Just a quick reminder, Office Hours sessions are, are designed, or at least my idea behind them was to do a short presentation. I've only got a few slides. And then we'll move on to sharing your experiences with cursor variables or any other topic you've got, either sharing your experience or asking questions, and hopefully we'll be able to answer everything you come up with. Please don't ask about specific account issues or SRs and bugs that you're working on with my Oracle support. Not the right venue for that, um, but hopefully you'll get them all resolved very quickly. Okay, so let's see. Let's go ahead and share my screen. So as I said before, this time we're going to focus on exploring cursor variables. So what is a cursor variable? Well, very simply, a cursor variable is a variable that points to a cursor's result set. There are two types of cursor variables. Well, first of all, the, the type that you use to declare a cursor variable, it's a variable declared in a type, PL SQL being a strongly typed language. It's a ref cursor, and you can either have a strong ref cursor in which the select list in your select statement for your cursor matches the definition in the ref cursor declaration, or a weak ref cursor, which you can use with any select you want, generally for dynamic SQL. And one point to keep in mind with cursor variables is that they don't persist in the way that a lot of other variables do. For example, I could declare a variable at the package level of type number, and it would sort of be this scratch area or global variable in that package. You can't declare cursor variables at the package level. You can even have a collection of cursor variables. They're pointers to active result sets in the database. So what are cursor variables good for? Well, first of all, one of the main things about a cursor variable and we'll see this in contrast specifically to explicit cursors, is that they're variables, obviously, that you can pass as arguments to other programs. So I can open a cursor variable in one block of code, and I can pass that cursor variable to another program that actually does the fetching, and maybe back to that original program to do the closing or whatever approach you want to take. In addition, along the same lines, you can pass back a cursor variable to a host environment, to a non-PL SQL environment, for example, a Java program, a .NET program. And those programs can read the contents of the cursor variables, fetch from the cursor variables into their own objects, and then process the data. So cursor variables are a useful mechanism for getting data out of the database and into non-Oracle or non-SQL PL SQL environments. Another nice aspect of cursor variables, and again, you're about to see all of this through the scripts, is that at runtime, you decide what select statement, essentially what result set, is associated with your variable, not at compile time. And there are two ways you can do that, either with static SQL, if this condition is true, then associate my cursor variable with this select statement, else this select statement. So completely static SQL, but you have a dynamic runtime association of that SQL with the cursor variable, and that minimizes the tax surfaces for SQL injection, or you can simply construct a select statement on the fly as a, as a string and open your cursor variable for that string. And a final way that cursor variables can be used, and hopefully you'll have even more ideas that you can share with us right on this session, is to make it easier to implement the most complex types of dynamic SQL, particularly method four, where either you don't know how many variables you're binding or you don't know how many things you're selecting back in your select list at the time you're writing your code at compile time. We'll take a look at some programs added in Oracle Database 11G to help with that. Well, like I said, not a lot of slides. So what I want to do is take a, go over to Live SQL and take a look at a, a few different scripts that I've created, and I think they're all mine, um, 
to work with cursor variables. And you can see I've created a little bit.ly for you. So bit.ly live SQL underscore CV. And you'll see these same four scripts and you can go exploring yourself later on. In addition, if you want to explore using cursor variables from Java, and you'll find similar pages in, in the rest of the doc set for other languages, you can go to bit.ly slash Java underscore CV, and it'll point you to that, to that documentation set. That's okay. So what I'm gonna do is show you some of my code, another hallmark of my office hour sessions. I'm, I'm so proud of the code that I write that I you know actually, what I'm willing to do is show you all the mistakes I make so you know that no matter how long you've been doing PL SQL, you can be as good as me and, uh, and nobody's perfect. So I'm showing you right now the DG SM promotions package of the DevGym. So this is DevGym social media promotion. So uh, as I mentioned, one of the other members of my team is Connor McDonald. And he is really great at all things Oracle database, just like Chris. And he also loves to hack around in other languages. And so what he's done is automate the tweeting of information from the dev gym. We have classes, we have workouts, we have all sorts of stuff going on in the dev gym. Do check it out, devgym.oracle.com. But we also wanted to automate the tweeting of that information, new workouts and so on. So I put together the PL SQL backend, which he could have done as well. But um, Connor took care of the client side, which is a Java program that calls this function. It returns a ref cursor, a cursor variable. Sysref cursor is a predefined weak ref cursor type. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So then I declare a cursor of that type. And then this is, this is one of the hallmarks of, a, of the cursor variable. I actually can, I say open cursor variable for and then I associate it with the select statement. And notice it's inside an if statement. If I've got something to promote, then use this select statement. If I don't have anything to promote, in other words, I've previously promoted all the workouts, so now it's time to go back and start re-promoting, then I open a different cursor. So this is the example of runtime selection and association of your select statement, your static select statement, with your cursor variable. So I simply open for as opposed to open an explicit cursor. And then I return the ref cursor, or I return the cursor variable. And here's another one, upcoming office hours. So when we promote out through our tweets, the upcoming office hours, this is how we do it. And again, this is even simpler. There's simply an open for, associate the select statement, pass it back, and done. Okay. Now, of course, this can be as complex as you want. And I'm not, I haven't shown you any of the dynamic versions yet. These are just static examples of cursor variables. So what I thought I'd do now is work through some of the more, the detailed aspects of some of the syntax. This is pretty much what you'll see in the live SQL scripts as well. So I had mentioned that a cursor variable is a variable that has to be declared based on a type and the type is ref cursor. This is an example of a strong ref cursor type. So I'm saying the type is, and I give it a name, it's a ref cursor, which means it's gonna declare a cursor variable and it's gonna return something of this structure. In other words, every row returned by the select statement associated with that cursor variable will have the same structure as a row in the all objects data dictionary view. This could also be an actual return type. I could say, sorry, a record type. I could say type X is record. And then I could say returning X. So it just has to be a record type of some sort. And this is classically what you would use, the format you would use when you're associating static select statements to your cursor variable at runtime. Since you know in advance what the list of select statements will be, and it's not gonna vary based on the different open fours, you can specify this at compile time. And what that means is that the PLSQL compiler will check all usages of this cursor variable of this type and make sure that the select statements match that return structure. So as usual, the more you can do at compile time, the more validation you get and feedback you get from the compiler to, to avoid runtime bugs, which are harder to find and, and fix. So that's a strong ref cursor type. Here's an example of a weak ref cursor type. I declare it, I give it a name, and I just simply say, it's a ref cursor. I'm not specifying the return type. And this is the approach you would use whenever you're, you're saying open cursor variable for a dynamically constructed select statement, which you'll see in a moment. But never ever do this, really don't do that because I think it was, wow, back in Oracle 9i, we've provided something called sysref cursor. So sysref cursor, we can actually look it up in the standard package, looks just like this. In other words, no matter what you change the name to in your weak ref cursor type, there's only one weak ref cursor type. They're all the same. 
So don't do it yourself. Just use oracles. Okay. So I've got a function. I say, get me all the objects in the schema. And I'm returning a cursor variable, so I put that in my name. I pass in the schema name. I provide an alternative filter, optional filter. No, not optional. And I return a cursor variable of this type. Then I've got data from any query. You pass in the query. I'll return the cursor variable. So again, here's an example of a dynamic of runtime selection of the select statement, but they're all static select statements. Now, I really didn't need a branch here for two different select statements for this kind of variability, but sometimes you'll end up looking at some very, very different select statements. That one has a join of two tables, one has a 16-way join, all sorts of possibilities. Now, you could switch, simply switch to dynamic ex construction of that SQL statement. That's harder to get right, it's a lot harder to debug, and it's harder to maintain. So if it really is just a small number of variations, and they, they can be expressed as static SQL, this is definitely the safer way to go and the easier way to manage the code. And here's an example of associating a cursor variable with a dynamic select statement. Simply open the cursor variable for whatever string. You, I can construct it right now, select my table, select my columns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you go on constructing your select statement. I suggest, by the way, that you never ever write your open fours this way, constructing your select statement right inside the for statement. Anybody have any thoughts about why I would say that's not a really great idea? Let's get some conversation going. I could think of a few reasons why that's not a good idea, but no, right. I'm sure so, that's... Henry says SQL injection. Uh, so you're right, Henry, that writing dynamic SQL like this opens up the possibilities of SQL injection. But what I'm saying, and so that's a really good point. What I'm saying is don't write the select statement here. In other words, you could write it here. Query, varchar2. So I could construct my select statement here. We still have a SQL injection problem. So just the fact that it's here is not causing a SQL injection issue. What kind of other issues? Why would I not want to put this here? Anybody else? Any other ideas? It's a quiet group. All right, quiet Chris. group. All right, Chris, you get to be smart. Uh, oh, okay, here, here we go. Shri, debug. Yes. Shri says debug. Shri, you're a very concise fellow. I really appreciate that. So you're right. Here's the issue. When you bury your select statements constructed runtime right here, look, the biggest problem with dynamic SQL is not understanding the syntax of an open for statement or an execute immediate statement, maybe DBMS SQL. The hard part is getting that construction right. For example, what if I didn't leave a space there? Oh, and then it gets smushed together, and all you get is this message saying, you know, unable to parse query or whatever the error would be. It doesn't tell you what the problem was. So what you always want to do when you're doing dynamic SQL, whether it's execute immediate, open for, is put it into a variable, execute the variable, and then if something goes wrong, you can grab that query string and log it, right? So for maintainability and for debugging purposes. And in fact, what many people do is create templates. So this might be select call list from tab list. And then before they do the open for, they will replace these tags with the actual strings. But you still want to put it into the variable that is then executed and can be, and can be logged. OK. Let's put it back to the way it was. OK. So one of the other really great things about cursive variables is that once you've gotten that cursor variable back, and obviously this process is really different from doing an explicit cursor, but once you get that cursor variable back, inside PL SQL, the code you would write to traverse the cursor variable to fetch rows to determine whether there's any more to fetch, all of that uses the standard PL SQL syntax for cursor management. So it's not like you, when you buy into the, or when you need to use a cursor variable, you don't have to buy into a whole new set of syntax that you have to deal with, for example, which you certainly would do when you're working with DBMS SQL. Okay. And in fact, even in this case, I could say fetch bulk collect into. So if you did, if you were fetching a lot of rows and you didn't want to do row by row fetching, which is certainly what you saw there, I can also do this. And this would be my list. So that works out fine as well. Once you've got that cursor variable back, you can essentially do all the standard cursor 
oriented uh, approaches with it. Ready? Go ahead. Got a question come in from Sven. Uh, what do you think about storing the dynamics statement into a global variable like g last SQL? I sometimes use that to avoid exception handlers on a lower level functions and only capture at some higher level. I. You go first, Chris. Any thoughts? So you're saying um, you you've got the main text of the SQL statement in a global variable. I guess that's what you're saying there, Sven. Um, that's what it sounds like to me anyway. So it looks to me like A is calling, B is calling, C is calling, D. D executes mm -hmm. the dynamic SQL statement. And Sven, it looks, sounds like you don't want to have error handling at D level or C level or B level. You want to have it only at A level, the very top. And then you want to be able to say, well, at this point, I'm not really sure what went wrong. So let's grab that last SQL statement and add it to my logging. Uh, I got you. Yeah, I and think I, I think. Sounds like a really good idea. In fact, I could see it being extended out to a number of different last operation caching sorts of things. Um, of course, you have to watch out for things getting out of sync and then you're storing something that is not relevant. So I suppose one downside, Sven, of that approach is you have to clear out your last SQL statement variable when you're done. Mm. So that could get tricky. I'm not saying it's you shouldn't do it as a result, but I could see it getting yeah. tricky. And um, I know this is an ongoing conversation among PLSQL developers and one of the areas in which Tom Kite and I had a difference before he retired. So now I can say whatever I want without worrying about having Tom criticize me. <sighs> what a relief. Um, actually, Bryn is really in the same position. So A calls B calls C calls D. A lot of people argue that you should only have exception handling at that top level. And why have it at every level below? First of all, it, it simplifies your code, it cleans things up, so that's nice. And then you don't have to worry about trapping it down at level D, re-raising it, and then trapping it and re-raising it and re-raising it, and maybe ending up with four entries in your log for one error. So those are good points for high level trapping of an exception. My counter argument, I, approach to, I tend to approach it differently. I tend to put a lot of exception handlers in my various programs. Um, part of it is probably a, a level of programmer's insurance, which is never a good thing to do. But the big loss, the big potential problem you have if you let your exceptions percolate up to the top without doing any logging along the way is that you lose that local context. So what were the values of the local variables at the time the error occurred? And in fact, Sven, that's what you're doing right here. You're saying, I'm losing my local context, so I'm gonna move it into a global context so I can grab it later. Now that's good. And I suppose you could generalize it and say, have a little API that says store current state and you could pass the values of variables and strings and it creates a string and it puts it into a, a JSON document. That's what it would be. I think that would work pretty well, but my approach is trap it locally where the error occurred, grab all the local values and store them and then propagate up. And then you simply have logic that says, I already raised this through my error handling routine. So don't, when I re-raise it, don't re-log it. Okay. What else we got from Biswadeep? Ref cursor to return values to calling program. Table function can be used in some cases. Ah, so rather than writing a ref cursor, we could build a table function to achieve similar results, I guess. And I guess this depends on how you want to consume the results, really, isn't it? Um, from the. Well, I uh, think actually, aren't these a little yeah. bit orthogonal? So for example, a cursor variable could certainly open for select from a table function. So mm, a table yeah. function doesn't replace the select statement. The table function replaces, let's say a 16 way join of, uh, it replaces the from clause. So mm. you're still, you've still got a select statement around the table function and the cursor variable is still gonna be valuable as a means of communicating that data set out to a non PL SQL, non SQL environment to grab that row of data and process it. That's really where the cursor variable, as far as I understand, comes in particularly handy. So for example, what we'll often do is create an object type. We'll select object type to, con to construct the object type from the different elements and send those back to something like a Java program because it will then convert that into an object in the Java environment mm -hmm. and be able to fetch and work with it. So I think that they're not one versus the other. It's more like you can put them both together. Yeah, you can certainly use both at the same time. And like you say, I think it's the ref curse is more about controlling the results you get back at the client level, isn't it? You know, if you could get a million, you know, a thousand rows from your query, but you want to let the client decide, mm -hmm. do I get one row, 10 rows or a hundred? Exactly. Exactly. Right. 
And then of course you can hide all the complexity of the SQL inside that function uh, that returns the cursor variable and the Java developer, the .NET developer never has to deal with any of that. All they have to know about is what's the format of the row being passed back. And Sven followed up from uh, that original comment saying, that's exactly what I want to avoid. And I assume mm -hmm. what you're mentioning Sven is the idea of logging multiple times going up and having multiple exception handlers. Um, so it's, you know, it's interesting. I've never really thought about creating this API to sort of cache your, your application state in a more flexible way. That's kind of what logger does actually. We, if you look at the logger API to, to throw values into a internal state, you're going to say Chris. Yeah, I, I guess I've got a slightly different way of approaching this. And I think that if you've got lots of nested calls, you know, program um, functions which call functions in a big chain, mm -hmm. um, for me, that's kind of a sign that maybe you need to rethink how you're coding, writing your code a bit because it just gets really difficult to debug and figure out what's going on. And also, you lose some of the, ability, the lowest level units. If you start fiddling with those, mm -hmm. then you potentially have quite a big global impact. So utility functions like logger absolutely make sense. You're going to call those throughout. But if you've got like um, business logic type stuff about, you know, is this what's this customer's credit limit and then you're building you're going to use that function repeatedly but then if you're building chaining that on other stuff um it can get quite difficult to debug and you get to the situation where people go well hang on i've got this function but it's also been used by other stuff can i really rewrite it should i change it do i write a new one um so i like to keep my structures my packages pretty flat um in that other than utilities, they pretty much just are self-contained, call themselves and other utilities rather than this helps avoid this um, nested calling each other mm. problem because then you can mm. store at package level um, variables that you need to keep the state of and helps get you out of the mess of what do we do if something goes wrong. Mm. Interesting. Well, you know, Chris has helped me a lot on the dev gym backend. I'm the main backend developer, Eli Feuerstein. He's somewhat related to me as the lead developer on the front end. And Chris and Connor have both helped me a lot in terms of tuning the backend. But I got to say, Chris, I should definitely have you come in and revamp my packages because I don't <laughs> have, I mean, I have a bunch of packages and they're very focused. So I'll have a, a, a package for the quiz manager, the class manager, the workout manager, but there's a lot of entanglement. It's a lot of calls, multiple level calls. I'm sure I at least go four and five deep. That'd be an interesting thing to hear from all of you too. If how, if generally, if your sense is that you're able to keep things relatively flat in terms of the call stacks or not a concern or whatever. Another question. Yes. How about performance impact using, using a ref cursor versus using some decode in case, et cetera, in a normal cursor or using with SQL to handle different conditions in the query? Let's, mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna go back to the code while Chris figures out how he wants to answer that. So uh, I guess, I mean, I'm not sure exactly where you're going with decode and case, but I think um, Stephen had the example where depending on the parameters, he opened two different cursors. And the, exam the advantage of doing, yeah, that code there, the advantage of doing something like that is that each statement is its own static SQL and you can figure out and optimize them individually. Whereas if you've got optional parameters, you've got to do things like use NVL or whatever to say, is this parameter null? If it is, then um, do something else. And those tend to be a struggle for the optimizer. If you have several of those types of conditions, um, it becomes really tricky for it to figure out what the correct row estimates are going to be, which if it's tricky to figure out how many rows it's going to get, it's unlikely it's going to find the, mm. the best plan. Um, so that's kind of the downside there. Uh, in theory, there's no real difference, but in practice, right. it can, can become a lot easier to tune your SQL statements when they're all static ones. So, and I think just to reinforce some of that, the, the, main, the main point I think we should keep in mind is that there's no performance drag by saying an open for a cursor instead of an explicit open cursor. Uh, I don't think you're ever gonna see a performance issue there. So it really comes down to how best to write your SQL statements that are inside here for maintainability and certainly for performance. Um, so I think again, there's somewhat orthogonal issues. You, mm -hmm. Whether you should use a cursor variable, if you need to pass back that data set to a non-Oracle environment that 
can easily work with cursor variables. You should use a cursor variable when you've got variability about the select statement at runtime, but you don't necessarily want to fall back into dynamic SQL. In fact, in your organization, the rule might be no dynamic SQL. Bryn Llewellyn, PL SQL product manager, for example, believes that you should be able to write your entire application without dynamic SQL and put all your static SQL behind APIs. And this is a key ingredient for doing that. Uh, so don't worry about the mechanism you're using. Pick the mechanism that makes the most sense for your, for your situation. Uh, and then of course, just make sure the SQL inside it is as clean and optimized as you can. Okay, now there was one other set of features I wanted to show you about cursor variables. And do, 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 now I just have to find it, let's see. I had them in my live SQL script. I was all ready for you guys. Okay, <laughs> there we go. So back in 11G, there was an enhancement made around cursor variables and dynamic SQL. So there are multiple levels of complexity for dynamic SQL and the, the most complex is dynamic SQL method four in which at the time you're writing your code, I'm hoping none of you could just hear that phone ringing. I'm not going to hear it. Excellent, so I'm going to start that again. For some reason, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting old. I'm not really great with all this technology. For some reason, my MacBook is now accepting calls on my phone. My phone is not here. Where's my phone? It's not here, but my computer is ringing me. Thank you so much. Okay, so the most complex kind of dynamic SQL is dynamic SQL method four, where at the time you're writing your code and compiling it, you either don't know how many variables you're binding in to your select statement, colon one, colon two, colon three, or you don't know how many things you're getting back in your select list. And that level of variability means that you can't really easily use execute immediate, even open four for, in many situations. Um, and you fall back on dynamic SQL, DBMS SQL, the age old historical mechanism for dynamic SQL, which we really want to avoid whenever possible because it's relatively slow. It is a pain in the neck to write and execute immediate is so much easier. But when you've got dynamic SQL method for this, it's pretty much the way to go. Here's the thing. You've got those two basic scenarios, variable number of bind variables, variable number of select items, items in the select list. Those are two very different cases. If those are both an element of your dynamic SQL construction, then that's it. You're gonna use DBMS SQL all the way through. But suppose you've got a static number of elements you're selecting, but you don't know how many bind variables they are. Or you have the reverse. You know how many things you're, you're binding, but you don't know how many things you're getting in your select list. Then you can actually combine DBMS SQL and cursor variables. So for example, in this case, I'm starting with DBMS SQL and I've got a static set of items that I'm selecting, but my where clause might have any numbers of things in it. Yes, obviously this could be a major SQL injection issue. The main thing here, in, in case you ever see code like this, a concatenation with a select statement or any kind of SQL and PL SQL statement is this should never be a string that a user types in on the website and passes directly to your program. Let them type whatever they want, but you've got to grab that text and sanitize it and check it before it's added to your select statement. That alone will greatly reduce the chance of SQL injection. Putting that aside, so I'm constructing my select statement. Now, because I have a variable number of bind variables, I've got to use my DBMS SQL interface to handle that. But I've only got that one select item. So rather than go through this looping process, loop through all your columns, fetch the column values, et cetera, I can say, okay, I execute my statement, but now I'm done with the DBMS SQL stuff. I'm gonna convert my cursor handle to a cursor variable. I'll return it. And then notice all that logic for DBMS SQL is hidden away here in this code. It's just the same old code you've been writing for decades for static SQL. Fetch bulk collect or loop. X, you know, fetch until the cursor is closed, all the standard syntax. So this, so the true ref cursor lets you convert from a dynamic SQL cursor to a cursor variable. And the other one is to cursor ID. So in this case, I don't know how many things I'm selecting at runtime, but my bind variables are fixed. So what I'm gonna do is start with a cursor variable. I construct my statement. I open my cursor variable for that statement. So that's a lot easier than all of this code of doing the bindings and so on. And then once I've got that, I convert it to a DBMS SQL cursor. I can then use this really cool feature of DBMS SQL called describe columns. And that gives me the select list. And then I can iterate through those columns. 
and then do the correct define column, and then I fetch the values, and then I get the column values out. But at least I was able to simplify this first phase of processing. So that's another way that cursor variables will come in very handy if you're working with dynamic SQL method four. And by the way, I mentioned that DBMS SQL has been around for a long time. Take a look at the describe columns interface. This is a procedure. You pass it the cursor, it passes back the collection of columns, and it passes back the number of items in the collection. This procedure is so old that it existed when collections were first introduced, and we didn't have the ability to find out how many elements were actually in the collection. Wow, that's some old code. Okay, let's go back to PowerPoint. Well, Chris, why did that? We've had another question come in. So saying any precautions needed for cursors that are not closed by calling programs? Excellent question. Your thoughts, Chris? Um, well, one of the key things you want to watch for is there is a limit to how many open cursors you can have. And if your programs are opening cursors all the time, you run the risk of hitting the aura 1000 or whatever it is, maximum cursors exceeded. Mm -hmm. um, so that is something you certainly need to watch for in terms of having all these cursors open all, all the time. Um, anything you want to add to that, Seaman? Or? Well, I would say just remember that this is a local value. So I'm declaring this cursor variable locally. I'm filling it up, I'm using it. Even if I don't close it, it will be closed by the PLSQL garbage handler automatically. So in a lot of cases, as usual in PLSQL, you don't have to worry, but in general, I would always close, if I have the ability to close. Now remember, if I've got a program like my social media promotion media promotions program, Connor calls upcoming office hours, gets back the cursor variable, iterates through the cursor variable, it's his job, it's his responsibility to close the cursor variable when done. Now I trust Connor. I don't know if you trust all your developers, but it's a good thing to remind them that if you're providing this API to them, that you make sure they know that they should clean up when they're done. So great point, excellent point to keep in mind and also an excellent reminder that PLSQL as much as possible will do that cleanup for you. All right, so these are the two elements that I just talked about, two ref cursor, two cursor numbers, cursor numbers are the main thing. If you ever find yourself having to write dynamic SQL method four, take a moment to analyze how, how dynamic it is, where it's dynamic to the extent that you can't use execute immediate and see if you can have cursor variables step in and take some of the programming load off of, of, off of the work. Okay. okay, now it's over to you for more questions and comments, and I believe we do have another question that just came in. Uh, can we use a cursor expressions as an input for a ref cursor? So I'm not sure, I because there is the cursor construct where you say cursor. Is that what you're referring to, Vamsi? Um, no, as yes. An input, as a, when you say as an input for a ref cursor, what are you thinking there? As a parameter being passed in? So the cursor, I believe we, you can convert the cursor expression to a cursor variable. Really a cursor expression would equate to a cursor variable. Hmm. A select statement can have multiple cursors inside of them. Um, but I'm not sure what it would, okay. And the function would pass, yes. Um, well, you can certainly call the function and pass it a cursor expression in the from clause. So for example, pipeline table functions will commonly have that. In terms of selecting the function from XYZ, passing it in as a parameter outside of the from clause, probably. I'm not sure right offhand. Yeah, I'm not sure either on that one. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm, as one of those, I'm not sure why you would really do that because you've, you've already got a cursor there, right? That, that's your cursor expression. So why are you passing it to another ref cursor? It's... Right, so the, and of course, in, in terms of your, sorry, I, if everybody can't see this, let me grab it out. Um, so this is the piece of little piece of code that he was sharing with us. This is the idea that, that he put in, or, or she. Um, so you can definitely, call, can definitely call function cursor variables. Pipeline table functions commonly do this when you're doing a streaming table function and passing data sets along through multiple transformations. But if this thing is returning a cursor variable, if this function returns a cursor variable, this would not work. 
you can't select a cursor variable from XYZ. A cursor variable is not a data type. The cursor variable returns rows of data that can then be put in the select list. So Niels is saying, if you have a select that returns a cursor expression and you want to call a function procedure on that expression, so you need to bind it. Okay, so you need to bind that cursor to a variable so you can actually fetch the result results out of it. I think it's that's one of these areas where it's again um, a kind of one it gets a bit tricky because then you've got a query which is returning a query with inside itself, mm -hmm. which gets a bit fiddly to <laughs> to do. Um, and in si so situations where you might have that as like master detail relations where you've got orders and order items, and of course you don't know how many items there are for each order, so you want to have a cursor to select the items out. Typically, what I've done in that case is do something like load all the items into an object or an XML or something. So it's rather than a, a row set, a result set, everything's there with the um, order itself rather than having to select them out individually. But I don't know what your thoughts, Stephen. Well, my thought is I just show, I thought I'd show you an example of a streaming table function, an example of using a cursor variable as an input to a function. So here's my pivot function. <coughs> I've declared a strong ref cursor type, which I believe would be required for a, a streaming table function like this. So what I'm passing in is actually a select statement, as you'll see in a moment. It's gonna be a cursor variable when it gets inside, but when I actually call it, I say, get all the data from the stock table, convert it to a cursor expression. That's taken in as a cursor variable, and then the stock pivot function does its operations and returns the data. So that's this is the scenario where I'm familiar about passing cursor expressions in his argument. So you can definitely do it. I'm not sure about all the different places in a select statement you can do it. Hmm. Okay, so other questions or comments about cursor variables, your experiences with them, and anything else on PL SQL or SQL or database, as long as I've got Chris here. <laughs> From Haney, I have a case in which I call SOAP web services and the response is stored in an XML type variable. While I parse that XML type, I always get an error due to a too short variable. Does XML type have a length limit? What is the recommended way to work with large XML types? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Not my specialty. Chris, you have much experience there? Or anybody uh, else on this call? Yeah, it's, so just for a high level, XML type doesn't have a sp specific limit that I'm aware of. I wouldn't but you think. do. You do have the general, assuming you're passing in a string, you're going to hit either the 4,000 or the 32,000 character limit, depending whether you're processing it in SQL or PL SQL. So it's not really the XML type itself, it's the string that you're passing into it, you might hit that limit. Um, so that would be what I'm watching for. I mean, it's messing around with XML is one where you really need to kind of get into the details to mm. help answer that kind of question because they, it gets tricky very quickly, basically. <laughs> and Haney, you might want to take some time to put together a live SQL test script and submit it as a question on, on Ask Tom or search Ask Tom for similar questions. There's an enormous database of tens of thousands, 15,000 questions out there, uh, and it might well be answered for you. And Chris doesn't have all of them memorized, which is, <laughs> I've got to talk to him about that after this call. <laughs> Oh, you know, like Tom answered half of them and, you know, Connor's done. <laughs> That's right. You each have half memorized. Cool. Yeah. All right. All right. Other questions or comments? SQL, PL SQL, database, autonomous database. Anybody have questions about the autonomous database? Well, well while we wait for some questions to come in, I, th I thought I'd share my experience working with cursor variables. Great. So um, we had a... It, it was kind of a dynamic SQL. It was work for an airline. You had to get the flight search results. And there was a lot of different parameters you could put in. So rather than build dynamic SQL, we had a massive case expression or, um, which selected the right static SQL based on the parameters you passed or the number of parameters you passed in to run the query appropriately. I think um, whoever wrote it, I think, was ultra defensive and some of the combinations were in fact impossible but oh. <laughs> there we go so um but 
one of the things we did is we didn't actually return the ref cursor to the client itself. We um, loaded that into an object type and then the object type was called from the Java application. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why we did that. First up, we always wanted to get all the results in one call to the client. So you didn't have to worry about, we don't want the client to say, yeah, stop after three rows or something like that. Um, so that way we can ensure load bulk collecting it all into a collection. Um, we know they get- So it was a collection of object types. Yeah, it was a collection of object types. It was mm -hmm. actually a collection of object types, which were themselves collections of object types. It was, it was, it was kind of a complicated thing, but um, so we avoided that problem, but we also avoided any problems with the uh, mid-tier developers forgetting to close curses and so on, mm. because as Stephen said, um, PLC will tidy itself up. Um, because that um, loading was all done in PL SQL, they just got the object type, type back. And we didn't have to worry about um, open cursors being hanging around and any issues that might kind of cause. Mm. Nice. So do you have any recollection of how many different select statements might have been defined in the case statement? It was over 20. It was a lot. Uh, okay. It was, yeah. Um, I actually, we had some change of requirements and I rebuilt it and used Dino, uh, DBMS SQL and just thought, right, we'll just use DBMS SQL and use the two ref cursor at the end okay. to pass it out. So uh -huh. um, it made the code a lot more readable because there was a procedure that was like, you know. <laughs> right. And it's funny because it's sort of a trade-off of readability, right? The, the dynamic SQL construction can also be quite difficult to read, but at least it's not as long. So it's, it's exactly. a trade-off. Yeah. Yes. Right. We had extensive logging of all the. Uh, I was going to say that's right. Lots extensive of extensive logging. There. Yes. But performance was good either way. It worked well. I mean, it was the uh, back end for the uh, main website for a few years. I believe mm -hmm. they uh, don't use it anymore. I think, as far as I understand, they've changed mm -hmm. since. But <laughs> yeah, for several years it ran pretty well, pretty solidly. Excellent. All right. Okay. Uh, last call for any other questions or comments. Looks like things have gone quiet, which is fine because we're coming up on the hour. All right. Thank you all for attending. Um, feel free to ask for specific topics. We had a request at the very beginning to take a deeper look at polymorphic table functions, a new feature added in 18C. Was that in 12.2 and enhanced in 18C? No, it was in, it was in 18C that yeah. it was certainly made publicly available. Okay. And if you have other requests, um, feel free to post them through the Ask Tom page or, or on the Dev Gym or send us emails or go to Twitter. All right, thanks for joining. Uh, hope to see you on our next Ask Tom Office Hour session. Happy coding, everybody. See you all. <laughs>